Now that I've reviewed Ben Edlund's initial 12-issue run of The Tick, I thought now would be a good time to cover the video game, a really strange effort released on the Sega Genesis and on the Super Nintendo by Fox Interactive in 1994. I'll be reviewing the Genesis version as that's the one I had as a kid, though I've played both. The SNES version has some different sound effects and the music tones sound a little different, but that's about it. I thought about saving this until I'd talk more about the cartoon, but what's so strange about the game is that it has a lot more to do with the comics than it does with the show. When I played it as a kid, I remember wondering who a lot of the characters were and if they just appeared in episodes I hadn't seen yet. After all, some of them were familiar. There are appearances by Deflator Mouse, American Maid, Super Urchin, and Shareface Chippendale, but there's also the Chainsaw Vigilante, Paul the Samurai, the District Manager, a lot of characters I talked about in the comic reviews. It turns out that some of the characters who were in the show are, of course, also in the comics, and that their comic book counterparts of the versions we see here, and that the show seems to serve far more as an excuse to make a game based on a really underground comic book that most of the people playing it would have never read. I don't know why they did that, but it seems like that's what they wanted to do. Besides a few characters not featured in the comics, we also get a lot of the cartoon soundtrack remixed into a 16-bit format. It's wonderfully catchy theme song, thank goodness, and even Townsend Coleman's voice sampled to say exactly three things, Spoon, Arthur, and Oof, when the tick gets knocked down. The game is pretty standard beat-em-up with occasional platforming bits. You play as the Tick, kicking and punching your way through waves and waves of enemies through 15 chapters based on stories from the early comic issues, with occasional bosses thrown in. There's not a whole lot of variety to the gameplay, but the Tick isn't just a generic sprite that looks kinda like the Tick. He does move like the real character, and some cute things are done with the combos. You can do pretty well just performing kick combos, kick, kick, roundhouse kick. The hit detection is pretty flaky, and enemies, especially the farther long you get have a tendency to move backwards whenever you move toward them, so you need the kick more often than not just for range. There are several punch combos though, which really aren't as effective as just plain kicking, but are nice to break up the monotony of hitting the same enemies over and over again in levels that often are about three or four times longer than they should be. If you press upward diagonally on your joypad while punching repeatedly, you'll pick up an enemy and throw them behind you, which can hit other enemies, but it's tough to line that up. If you press forward while constantly punching, you'll flick the enemy and knock him down, which is a nice touch for the tick, as that's something we see him do in the cartoon and in the comics, and if you press diagonally down toward your enemy while constantly punching, you'll bash him on the ground back and forth over your head, and again, Again, if you line that up right, you can hit other enemies that way as well. The only special move you have is Arthur, who you can use a limited amount of times for each set of lives. When you activate him, he just flies across the screen and kills all your enemies. Pretty standard special move for a beat-em-up. It's really a shame, especially with all the hero cameos, that there's not a two-player mode. There's certainly enough enemies on the screen a lot of the time that it would be a lot less grueling if two players were playing at once, and it seems only natural since the Tick has a sidekick. Sometimes you'll find a hand icon that brings in a fellow hero to help, you control both back to back, usually while Tick kicks the other punches and vice versa. And it's kind of cumbersome and not all that helpful since it slows you down and as I said, the enemies like to run away from you before they come at you and the hit detection is not very good. When they have projectiles, especially when you get to the idea men, this makes for a lot of frustrating cheap shots. You'll want to turn on the max number of lives continues and Arthur's in the options screen at the beginning because you're going to need them. If you can beat this game with less, you're a better tick than I. The game took me four hours to complete, which is super long for a 16-bit beat-em-up, and this is the first time I've made it all the way through, but I had to use the Game Genie code for unlimited continues. The furthest I've ever gone with the standard max allotment of lives, Arthur's and continues, without cheating is about midway through the last stage. I wanted to cheat on this one just so that I could show you the ending. For a beat-em-up, the game is really long, which I would appreciate a lot more if there were more enemies, more variety to the gameplay, and if some of the levels weren't so ridiculously long. I mean, really, who builds a kitchen like this? It's the same stove over and over again, and it just keeps going. Same with this dining room, it's crazy! The people making this game clearly like the tick and managed to make it far from a generic game where the only recognizable thing is the main character's face, but the gameplay itself is extremely frustrating. I really think the only reason to play this is if you're a diehard tick fan like yours truly, or if you really need something ultra pointless to waste in an afternoon with. But I'm going to show you all the fun stuff so you don't even have to play it if you don't want to. 
If you let the options screen run a while, you'll see a roster of every character in the game walking into a spotlight and doing something indicative of who they're supposed to be with their name underneath. It's pretty cool that they made as many sprites as they did for all these characters, and a little head-scratching that if they were going to go so far as to include, say, Human Bullet and Captain Lemming, they couldn't create a wider variety of enemies to fight during the main gameplay so that you're not just fighting the same ninjas over and over again and then the same idea men over and over again, etc. There's some clever stuff done with supporting characters from the comics and the show. Sewer Urchin pops up for manholes to knock you or your enemies over, and if you situate yourself on one side of him from the enemies, you can use Sewer Urchin to take them out for you. There is an odd programming glitch here I want to mention, by the way, where the tick and any enemies that get hit when Sewer Urchin is visible yell out, and they all make the exact same noise. Everywhere else, that noise only happens when the tick gets knocked down, so now all the enemies are yelling in Townsend Coleman's voice. And several heroes and villains are used as mini bosses when you fall off during the platforming roof jumping scenes, which happens a lot until you get used to the annoying way stuff is thrown at you during those levels. I'll talk about that in a second. When you fall from a roof, you don't lose a life, but you do have to fight a character chosen for a random assortment, and they're pretty cleverly done for the most part. When you hit a boss, he jerks back for a second and then comes back at you, so unless you want to get hit as soon as he recovers, you pretty much have to hit him, run away, and then come back and hit him again. For taller bosses, jump kicks work the best. Anyway, you've got the running guy who's probably the hardest of these mini-bosses and most irritating. He just runs really fast and knocks you down unless you can hit him first. You have to repeatedly hit the kick button because it's pretty impossible to time it. The rest of them are more fun. Chainsaw Vigilante is straightforward, just avoid getting smacked when he swipes his chainsaw, kick him a few times and he's done for. Red Scare is easy, he's the one you can actually hit repeatedly and he doesn't fight back, because in the comic, he's hired to show up and get defeated by superheroes to make them look good, which happens with the running guy in issue 6. That's a nice touch. Clark Oppenheimer's pretty great, too. If you just keep kicking and punching him, nothing happens. So run to the other side of the screen and you'll find a piece of Otter Creekite, the kryptonite-like substance Tick discovered in issue 2. Tick automatically picks it up, and Clark's defeated. The other supporting characters that pop up a lot are American Maid, Oedipus, and Paul the Samurai, who are just used in that lame back-to-back -back feature I mentioned earlier, usually in a place where they were involved in a story. So Oedipus shows up a lot during the ninja section, and American Maid shows up when you're on your way to Chairface's party, since she's in that episode of the cartoon show. Paul the Samurai has his loaf of bread, or at least I think that's what it's supposed to be, but it's too bad American Maid couldn't have thrown shoes somehow. Actually, I come to think of it, a character with projectiles would have been really useful in this game. Deflator Mouse pops up a couple times too, but he's useless, of course, because, well, he's Deflator Mouse. So he just stands there and doesn't do anything until he gets hit once, and then he jumps away. I do enjoy those silly touches that actually use something about the characters to affect the gameplay, and it's fun that it doesn't always work in your favor. It's just unfortunate that that same level of creativity doesn't translate to the overall gameplay. Besides punching and kicking guys, as I mentioned, there's occasionally a roof jumping part and that helps break up the monotony, but it also has its own set of annoyances. There are projectiles coming at you a lot and it's hard to predict where they're going to fly. Even if you play this a lot and you get a good sense of when to jump and when to duck, you're gonna get hit. When you get to the edge of a roof and you have to jump across, sometimes there's a spear or some other object in the later levels that comes down. Now you'd think there's just a pattern and you can jump between the spears, but of course not. They drop based on when you jump. Yeah. So with most of them, you have to jump forward to fake a spear in the dropping, jump back, and then jump across. I do enjoy the various ballet-esque animations Tick does when he jumps in these sections, though, and I wish there were more of them. I completely forgot about them midway through the Idea Men, and when one of these levels came back, I thought to myself, I wish I was doing more of this during that 20 minutes or so I was walking through the freaking kitchen. I think this is a game where a lot more platforming would have been really, really welcome. Toward the end of the game, they get really really nonsensical and not in a good way. At one point you're jumping between boats instead of roofs that I'm pretty sure couldn't even kinda hold Tick's weight if you were to jump on them. And I know it's 16-bit, but it is kinda too bad they couldn't animate some of the roof falling off when Tick jumps between them since that's his trademark. The music is great, written by the same people who did the show's soundtrack, and it provides most of the game's atmosphere. There's a good variety at first, but the game's so long that it needed more music. It starts to get repetitive after a while, and once you get to some of the otter locations later, like the beach and then Thrackerzog's dimension, the music really stops being appropriate, and it needs something else. 
it seems from the beginning, if you've read the comics, like maybe the game is going to follow the comics pretty closely, though there's no inner titles or anything like that to give you any story context, just chapter headings, several of which are titles of the comic stories, like Night of a Million Zillion Ninja. A lot of Ben Edlund's comic art is used in the game, in full color, of course, and looks really good, so that's fun. As the game goes on, it gets more and more random, just grabbing from here and there and throwing bits of source material in the game. During the ninja section at the beginning, some levels are based right off of scenes in the comics, like when the tick crosses a yard over a telephone wire, but the level design gets lazier as it progresses. You start off fighting on a bus. While that's kind of fun, since that's how the tick gets to the city, it's a terrible place to start a beat-em-up. The first thing a player is going to do is test out what button does what, and you're liable to jump right off the bus doing that and immediately lose a life. Again, unless you're using cheat codes, you can't afford to throw any lives away. The game's way too long and it's way too easy to lose lives. Then you start fighting ninjas. Lots and lots of ninjas. Some you can kill with a couple of hits, some take more. Some have swords, some have nunchucks, some throwing stars. It's pretty straightforward. Again, most of the game is punching and kicking guys. If you walk for a while, you'll start running, and sometimes you have to do that to catch up to a bad guy you're trying to hit who keeps walking backwards. It seems like they're sometimes programmed to move with you to keep their distance, which is ultra maddening, especially later on when you're dealing with the idea men all of whom have guns and can get a lot of easy shots off at you. There are basically four big sections based on whatever kind of enemy you're fighting. First, it's ninjas, and at the end, you have to fight, of course, the district manager. There are some mini-bosses at the end of some levels, too, like the forehead, who are just like the major bosses, except they don't take quite as long to kill. Then there's the idea men, at the end of which you'll fight Chairface Chippendale. He's the most fun boss, as he's the one boss where you actually have to do something that has something to do with the story he's involved with, rather than just hit him a lot. You have to take out various parts of his moon-writing gun in order before he gets all his letters on the moon. It's a little tedious, but cleverly done. Then you fight the clowns, which I'm especially surprised by, as they're not featured at all in the main Tick comic, but rather in the Man-Eating Cow spinoff. I suppose the show had Proto-Clown, but not a whole underground society of gang clowns like in the comics. It might have been cool if he'd been the big boss for this section. Wouldn't have made a lot of sense, but who cares? And then it gets really weird. At the end of this, you fight the Red Scare again, like the game is just recycling enemies now. He's guarding this interdimensional portal that goes to Thrakerzog's dimension. I have no idea why they chose him for this. Finally, you fight a bunch of aliens, none of which are susceptible to any of the fun punch combos except the flicking one, I think. And then at the very end, you finally fight Thrakerzog, which, for a game that's marginally clever, is the laziest final boss I think they could have come up with. He has two tentacles. They wave up and down. You kick them each repeatedly until they disappear. Congratulations, you win. Earlier, you have to fight a random birthday cake with guns on it, and that feels awesome compared to this. Shareface is the Tick's best-known villain, and by this point, they're getting pretty random on the order of events anyway. And actually, they're even just making up events. It's not like Tick went to Thrakerzog's dimension in the comics or anything. So why not put the really lame Thrakerzog in the middle of the game and put the comparatively decent Shareface mood writing bit at the end as the final boss? It feels very much like the developers didn't expect anybody to make it to the end. Not only is Thrakerzog a gigantic disappointment after four hours of repetitive button mashing, and by the way, why not use the serious version of Thrakerzog who actually walks around and maybe throw a clone Arthur and Mucus Tick in there, since clearly the comics and the show were all up for grabs here? But I got trapped for several minutes in the level just before the final boss and thought I was going to have to quit. Not kidding. Just all the enemies disappeared and I couldn't go anywhere. If you go too far up when there's still enemies to kill, you can't move forward. But at one point, it wouldn't let me progress and I had already killed everything. I went back. No bad guys. Went forward. Nothing. I did this for two or three minutes. Killed myself. Wasted some Arthurs. Anything to jar the game into throwing some aliens at me so I could do something. Nothing. Finally, just as I was about to give up, some aliens showed up and I could kill them and move on. Then in the next section, it happened again, and this time it took even longer before the aliens showed up. And I'm thinking, Thrakerzog better be awesome. Guess the joke was on me. So what's your reward for four hours of redundant punching and kicking, getting screwed with by enemies that move around based on how you move and are pretty hard to hit anyway because of the bad hit detection, and platforming that's sometimes okay and other times stupid hard? A picture of Tick and Arthur on the Tick cycle that says the end, and then the credits. That's it.
Okay, two things. First, and I know it's ridiculous that I'm even questioning story in this game, but where did Tick and Arthur get the Tick Cycle in this? Why isn't it featured in the game? Why can't I drive it in some section? And if the Tick Cycle is even referenced here, why isn't Barry in the game? Since in the comics, that's who owns it. For that matter, why isn't there a battle in the Comet Club? That would have been fun. And it would have been a good final boss, since Barry is where Ben Edlund's comics leave off, and that's mostly what this game is based on. But much more importantly, this is the screen you also get when you lose. That's right. When you lose all your lives and continues, you get the same screen that you get if you win. Apparently, Tick and Arthur are celebrating no matter what happens. You could lose all your lives and continues and everything on the bus, and Tick's like, Oh well, I'm a superhero! Yay! I gotta tell ya, I hadn't played through this thing in a long time. Remember when I said I once almost got all the way to the end without cheats? That was on a night just out of high school over the summer when I had nothing better to do, nearly ten years ago. I've always kind of wondered how it ended. And this is what I get. Wow. I'm gonna give it the tick a 1.5 out of 4. There's some clever fan service, but that doesn't make it very playable, and I suppose I had a lot of patience before just based on my love for the character. It's a lot more fun for the first hour than it is for the last three, with the exception of Chairface, and it's sad because clearly the problem was laziness, assuming that everyone would give up before they even got to the end, or maybe even before they got halfway through. There's no doubt in my mind that these developers could have made a way better game.